This is STL Radio. I want to tell you that I believe that we're really in exciting times. Some of the times are very negative. We see a lot happening, but everything we're seeing is a fulfillment of, of, of what we know was coming. We, we knew it. We've told people. Hal Lindsey, who knows who Hal Lindsey is? Raise your hands. Hal Lindsey and I were together, and Hal says, uh, you know, it's the most amazing thing to live long enough to see what you wrote about. And I said, how do you think the prophets feel if they could come back and say, I told you that. I told you this was going to happen. So tonight we're going to do a very great, I think, word from God that deals with prophetic things. And we're going to have an altar service for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your offerings. I want to say that uh, it goes 100% to ministry. We use them. We have a lot going on more than I've ever had in my life. And the other thing I will mention to you is I appreciate our team that comes and, uh, from OCI and helps. And, uh, of course, the Jamesons are here, too. They help and helps run the CDs and the tables. And so the album, after, give them time just to run tonight's service, and you can get your album tonight, and the team will be there uh, providing the CDs for you that, you that got those. And I just want to mention our prophetic summit. I usually stand here and say, we want you to come to Cleveland to the prophetic summit. Well, we got 5,000 people coming and had to close the booking down, you know, so we, we, our registration is packed. But if you want to come, stay in tune with us and kind of uh, go to our perrystone.org. And if we have cancellations, maybe you can get there. And that's going to be in April. T listen to this. Three and a half days, 12 services. Three services a day. And it is an overload. You walk out of there by Sunday going, you know, you really do. It's Jonathan Kahn and all these other great guys coming are with us. So thank you for that. And again, sound men, thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started right now. Um, for the next few moments, I want to give you a thought that has come to me through research of the word of God on the subject of the last sign, the last sign before the tribulation will begin. And most of you understand when I say the word sign, what I'm alluding to. It's a word the disciples ask Christ, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Now, the end of the world there is kind of a misnomer the way it's translated in English because in the Bible, in the, in the Greek, there are three words for world. I don't know if you know this. One is the population of the earth. One is the planet itself. And one is the civilized world. And in the setting of the word uh, world there, it actually means the end of the age. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Not the end of the planet. That's a misnomer. The end of the age. The, the age of man's government that transfers to the government of the Messiah. Now, we know that, that for signs to be fulfilled, you must come into a season of prophetic acceleration and prophetic signs. In other words, biblical things that have been predicted that begin to happen that you absolutely know without a doubt are a part of what we call last days, end days, time of the end uh, that lead to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in line with this, let me just say something to you that's very, very important that I believe that there are prophetic milestones and I believe there are prophetic stepping stones. Some things are not a direct fulfillment of prophecy. They are a part of a fulfillment. I'll give an example. The flu in China, they now say at least 100,000 people probably have it and they're still spreading it, would be considered pestilence in different places. Matthew 24, verse 7, when you study the Greek word pestilence, which means a plague that can end in death. Now, is that fulfilled, Matthew 24, yes and no, because he says pestilences, meaning one is not the fulfillment, many happening becomes the fulfillment. Here's another example, earthquakes in diverse places. There's always been earthquakes, but the question is this, is it one big one? No, it's plural. It means a series, a succession of them that happen at certain times. Then they begin to accelerate closer together and the magnitude of them becomes larger. It's not a three, five, it's a six, seven, it's a seven, four, it's a eight, one. And this is how the signs of the time in Matthew chapter 24 work. 
And one of the interesting verses in Luke, and I've got to show you this. In, in Luke's gospel, chapter 17, there's a few verses, but chapter 21 is very significant because Luke 21 and Mark 13 and Matthew 24 all sort of deal with the same predictions that Jesus is giving to his disciples of what to look for before he actually returns. And when you start looking, you say to yourself, I've had critics say this to me. Oh, preacher, come on. Always been earthquakes. Always been famines. There's always been pestilence. There's always been war. Dear God, World War I, look how many people died. Then World War II came along. So you're telling me that we're in the time of the end based on what? This verse. Luke says, when all of these things begin to come to pass. Did you just hear what it said? It's all of the things. Now here's the key to knowing the time of the end. The key to knowing it is when you see a major famine coupled with plagues breaking out, combined with an earthquake that happened that afternoon. Come on, talk to me now. Then the war and then a rumor of war. I mean, I mean uh, they just broke on the news. I don't know if it did damage. I don't know if anybody was killed, but somebody shot a missile into the dining room at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. <laughs> Woo, somebody's in trouble. <laughs> if you heard me preach the other night, you'll understand why I'm saying that. So the point is that it's when everything starts happening at once, that verse, that verse, that verse, that verse, that verse, then it starts happening at once, then it starts happening very close together near the same time. This is how we know we are coming toward the time of the end. But that's not the key to the message that I want to give you tonight. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? Because what I want to talk about is something that triggered me in my research and study. And I would say to myself, I would say, Perry, there's got to be something that triggers everything else. There's got to be something that happens and I said, God, how do we know there is a time of the end? Now, I'm going to save the big one for just a minute, but I'm going to give you something that's very significant. And I want you to track with me because I feel the spirit of God talking to my mind and spirit to lay something out before you right now. That's very, I think, very, very significant. When we talk about the return of Christ and we talk about the signs of his coming, there's something that's very, very significant. Oh, put your hands up and just pray with me because I could go five different ways. Say, Lord, help him. Say, help him stay on track. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. There are several different things that we could look at. And here's one that I want to give you. I'm going to give you something that triggered me the other day. The gospel has to be preached in all the world and then the income, Matthew 24, 14. I want to key up on what causes the end to come for a moment. This is still not the message, by the way. This is a nugget you're getting for free. If the gospel must be preached in all nations as a testimony and then the end would come, then, then how does the end come with the preaching of the gospel? The assumption has always been that when the gospel goes into all nations, in fact, that word in all the world is the Greek word for civilized world. It's actually a Greek word that would mean in, in, in Jesus' day, it would mean spread throughout the whole Roman Empire. That's what it would mean. So we would assume that the end comes when the satellites are over all the nations, right? When the internet availability to the gospel is there, and it is. Missionaries are all over the country, and they are. So it's okay. Now, once the gospel is in the nations, Jesus said the end would come. But I'm going to give you the real trigger. I'm going to tell you when you know it's over. And this is what spooks me about America. Because in Romans 11, the Bible tells us that the Apostle Paul said that Israel had the covenants, the oracles of God and God's chosen people, but they went into blindness. And the Bible said that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. 
I looked at that verse from all of the old translations from the 1600s, 1500s, 1700s, and the commentaries by Barnes and Adam Clark and every other person. And it seems that that statement, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile comes in. They all translated until the full number of Gentiles that are supposed to be in the kingdom come into the kingdom. Till the full, full number of Gentiles from the nations hear the gospel and receive Christ. Every scholar from the 1800s back seems to feel that when Paul talked about in Romans 11, Israel not being able to see who their Messiah was and the Gentiles being grafted in is somehow connected to blindness coming to Israel until God has preset and preordained the number of Gentile souls in the last day to be a part of the kingdom. And when he reaches that number, it is called in your Bible, fullness of times. And that's when the rapture happens. And this is what these men talked about and wrote about. And we've studied this. But you hear me very well with what I'm about to say. In America, to me, is becoming hardened. People have gone beyond picking sides. They have gone beyond their political and spiritual opinions. And now you see people who are completely, totally hardened. A lady that was here that was a partner showed me a text. She says, I went to text my ex-husband. This was his old number. And I was going to tell him that I'm in church. And I get it back that you've got the wrong number. And there's a satanic pentagram on her screen. And whoever this was says, I am a Satan worshiper and I don't want to have anything to do with your lying Jesus. This is how hardened people are becoming. They're turning to witchcraft. That's the most popular religion right now in America, popular. They're turning to the occult. They're turning to the new age. They're turning to Satanism. Now stay with me until their hearts are becoming hard. Watch blindness happens to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile comes in. And then, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to know or you want to know what happens after that, watch this. What happens after that is Israel's eyes are opened and the Gentiles' eyes go blind. Read it in Romans chapter 11. It's stunning. That's what Paul talks about. Now, here's how I know we're still not on the message. We will get there in a minute. <laughs> but I've got to give you this nugget. This is how we know, ready, that we have reached the actual time of the end and it's all about to be over. It's in Revelation. It's found three times and it says this. One verse says, and when the judgments came and the sun began to scorch men, men did blaspheme God and his tabernacle in heaven. Then it says three times, here's the sins. They repented not of their fornication, nor their sorceries. And that word is pharmakia, which actually would mean drug addictions. Their idolatry. Four sins in the tribulation that are listed in the book of Revelation. Three times, you hear me, it says, and men repented not. When a plague can hit where people are dropping dead in hospitals on the road and men are not repenting, we've just about reached the end. When an earthquake comes to a city and takes it down and people are blaming God for it and cursing God's name, if this has happened recently and they won't repent, we're coming to the time of the end. Here's my point. There is no necessity for the preaching of the gospel when men have become so hard they're no longer repenting and that my friend is what introduces the tribulation so the more you see in america people mocking christianity mocking the bible mocking preachers demanding people to bake a cake for homosexuals when the person is a christian Locking them up in prison. Hey, a guy the other day, he shouldn't have done this. This was wrong, but he took a gay or lesbian fl fl flag and burned it. And he got fined for a month and put in jail 16 years. But yet they stand and burn an American flag that men have died for in Washington, D.C. And nobody gets arrested. 
This is the hardness of people's hearts. This is what we're talking about. When nothing is making sense and no one wants to hear the preaching of the word of God. Are you still here? Shout yes. yes. Now, I've, 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 I've looked into the word and I've said, okay, I want the Lord to quicken to me or to show me the trigger. And he showed me that one. That one I wasn't even going to preach on tonight. But that's definitely one. Let me ask you something. Can anybody see it? There was a day when you'd have a gospel meeting and people would show up and their hearts were tender. Back in the days of Billy Graham, all of New York stood on the street. Los Angeles, what did he have? Like an 11-week revival and famous people coming to know Jesus. It does not happen now. Men are, men, are, men are becoming hardened. That's a sign. But it's not the main one. Somebody give the Lord a praise while we get ready to go into this. Somebody give him a praise. <laughs> there are signs that when you see them, they point to the big event. When Christ was about to come to the earth, it said, Behold, the Lord will give you a sign, Isaiah 7, 14. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in Luke's gospel, the angel Gabriel comes to a virgin by the name of Mary in the city of Nazareth and begins to inform her that she will conceive a son and call his name Jesus, and he will save the people from their sin. So when a virgin conceived of the Holy Spirit, the seed of the Son of God, it started, as we would say, the ball rolling for the Messiah to come. One sign, just one sign. When you see and hear that a virgin has conceived, then you'll know this is the sign. God, I feel the Holy Ghost myself. I don't know what you feel, but I began to feel something in this place. Then Jesus says, now when you see Jerusalem compact, compassed with armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And get out of the city and don't look back. And if you're on the rooftop, don't come into the house to take anything out. Now he was telling them something. He was saying, there's going to be an invasion. The city's going to be destroyed. And I'm going to give you the sign to look for when it happens. And I've studied the works of Josephus on the destruction of Jerusalem. I've studied three of the early church fathers. Eusebius was one of them. Origen was another one. And here's what's amazing. Are you ready? In 66 to 70 AD, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, for four years, Vespasian had the city of Jerusalem surrounded. He was elected emperor. He pulled out. He got his son Titus to come in with the army. In the break between the time Vespasian left and the time that Titus came in, there was a small opening window. According to early church fathers, an angel angel of the Lord came to the elders in Jerusalem and said to them, the destruction is coming soon. Get out and go to a place called Pela. The angel told him where to go. Philip Scaff, History of the Christian Church, records the event that Christians began to pull up and uproot. What did they do? Let me tell you what they did. You can read this in the book of Acts. Why did Barnabas sell property in the city of Jerusalem? Why did Ananias and Sapphira sell property in the city of Jerusalem? Why do you not read in the book of Acts that the Christians were selling property in Antioch? They were not selling property in Ephesus. They were not selling property in anywhere of the seven churches. Why is it history records that Christians started selling all their stuff in the city of Jerusalem years before? I'm going to tell you why. Because if you had a prophetic word that a tsunami was about to hit Jacksonville, and in a year you had a year to get out, you'd sell everything you could. If you knew it was a word from God, you'd go somewhere else. And people that believe the word of Christ, believe the destruction was coming, they start selling their stuff. They didn't do it anywhere else. But they did it in the city of Jerusalem. And God is so, God is so amazing because years before they moved from Jerusalem to Pela between 66 to 69 AD, years before, 
a bunch of apostles went down to Pela. Pela is a city that was located across the Jordan River in the country of Jordan, not far from the Sea of Galilee. In fact, it, it's not, when I say not far, just so you know the area, down into Jordan. You know what they did? They had a revival. You know what happened in the revival? They had miracles. You know what happened in the revival? Demons came out of people. You know what happened in the revival? Healing started taking place. And that whole city turned toward the Christian faith. Watch this. So years later, when the Christians left Jerusalem, they were welcomed with open arms because the revival had already hit. God had the place set up for the people to escape that he warned them, when you see Jerusalem compassed with army, flee to the mountains. Hallelujah. He had it all figured out. Now, the sign was, when you see a trench dug, this is in Luke, when you see a trench dug, Josephus said they started digging trenches. When you see a trench dug and you see the city surrounded, get out. Any way you can, get out. So watch this. The sign of the destruction in 70 AD, which occurred with by the 10th legion who killed 6,000 Jews on the temple platform and in the city of Jerusalem, who burnt the temple to the ground and when the, when the fires cooled, toppled the stones of the temple to peel the gold off that was melted. Before it happened, there was one or two signs. And Jesus said, when you see it, you got to move. Are you still tracking with me? Say yes, amen. I'm going to give you one or two more. I'm going, to, well, I'm going to give you maybe one more here. Mm. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. Now, I'm going to read this verse to you from the King James translation of the Bible. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. 120 are recorded. There may have been less. There may have been more at that moment because that was a recording of those in the upper room. We assume they all stayed for this event. They're speaking in tongues. The fire of God has fallen. The city of Jerusalem near the temple is all in topsy-turvy, trying to say, what meaneth this? What is going on? And Peter said, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonder in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath blood, fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. Peter did not make that verse up. If you're not familiar with this, Peter has quoted almost verbatim the prophecy given by the prophet Joel. And when you go to the prophet Joel, he's three chapters. The first chapter, he talks about complete ruin. The locust has eaten. The palmer worm has eaten. The caterpillar has eaten. A northern army is coming to destroy the place. Then the second chapter, he talks about restoration. I'm going to restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm hath eaten and the palmer worm. And then the third, when he talks about the revival. <laughs> so you've got ruin, restoration, and then you have revival. But I, I, you know, and I'm a King James guy. I quoted, I've been quoting the King James since I was about 15 years of age. If I go and read another translation, my mind kicks to King James. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm the, 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 and the, therefore, and the shout. And that's just, how many like that version? Raise your hand. Good. That's what my Bible's in. So that's why they get it, you know, because 1611, that's the version we use. Now, I want to show you something, though, and I have done the word study from the Greek New Testament and from the Hebrew and can prove to you what I'm saying is correct. When Joel is talking about the restoration of Israel, the Babylonians had come in and messed up everything, burnt the temple down, took the Jews captive, and God is telling him, it's not going to end this way. I'm about to restore some things. But it's one word. Look at your neighbor and say, he said one word. He said one word. One word changes all of the meaning from Peter's statement to Joel's statement. Y'all want to go there with me? Put your hand up, wave it this way. We'll go there. Just making sure. There we go. All right. Peter said this. It shall come to pass in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. Five times that word last days is used in the New Testament, and it means the final days. The final days before something great. It can mean the final days before Christ returns. It can mean the final days before something else, but final days. In Acts 2, 1 through 4, mm, 
He said it's going to be poured out on men and women, servants and handmaids. Do you understand that it was rare for a female to have the anointing on them anywhere in the Old Testament? It was predominantly a man thing. Hello. Your men were kings. Your men, except for Deborah, were judges. Your men were prophets, except for Huldah and a one or two more who were prophetesses. It was a man. But God said, I'm an equal opportunity employer. So before, so long before in the 1960s, the, the, you know, the sexual revolution came in the 1980s, the women, fem, the feminine revolution came long before everybody said, let's make women equal with men. God comes along and says, well, they are different. I created them different. But just so you'll know, when we get to the last days. I'm going to pour out my spirit on both of them because I need both of them to do what needs to be done in my kingdom. <laughs> All right. Now. There's going to be signs before the notable day of the Lord. Now watch this. The word notable here in Greek is epiphanes, which is, or the epiphanio, which is the word for the appearing of God. It actually translates God manifest. Antiochus Epiphanes. You probably have heard the name Antiochus Epiphanes, who offered a pig on the altar, stopped the Jews from worshiping on the Sabbath, stopped Jewish circumcision. His name means Antiochus, God manifest. He was a ruler parallel to what the Antichrist will do. Won't have time to get into that. If you've ever heard the name, that's where the name comes from. So here's a Greek word in the Greek Bible, not talking about that man, but means God manifest. So all of this will happen before God manifest or what before the rapture because that word epiphania is used in the Greek New Testament for the return of the Lord eight Greek words are used for the return of the Lord the Lord coming back and that ha that happens to be one of the Greek words where he is made visible where he manifests where people are finally able to see him as he is so is everybody still tracking this gets a little deep right here but don't want to lose you yeah, all right. For all of you that said, come on, here we go. I will now go to Joel chapter 2 and read what Peter quoted. And you tell me if you find a different word here that it changes the context and timing of everything. For it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And also upon the servants and upon my handmaids in those days, I will pour out of my spirit. That sounds, you know, if you're not careful, you'll think it's exact word for word. It's not. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Now, it sounds like it's the same prophecy, but there's one word Peter changed that was not the word Joel used. And you've got to hear me and get this explained in your spirit. Peter said the outpouring will come in the last days. Joel said it'll come afterwards. And that's two different words that are not even close to each other in the original meaning of the words. So to explain this, here's what we have to go back to. Many nominal people believe that speaking with other tongues passed away a long time ago, either with the death of the apostle John, the last apostle, or with the completion of the 27 books of the New Testament canon by the 4th century. And it's called the doctrine of cessationism, meaning that the mir miraculous gifts of the Spirit, including tongues and interpretation and prophecy, have ceased somewhere by the 5th century. And there are churches in Jacksonville, Florida, where a pastor will stand behind a pulpit, really all over the United States, not just Jacksonville, and will tell their people tongues have ceased. Tongues no longer exist. These people who say they speak with tongues are foolish. They are deceived. It is a bunch of jibber-jabber, jibber-jabber. Some will go as far, and this is close to blasphemy, and say it's of the devil or it's satanic. So they're going to give you all these reasons why, and here's what they say. It is Peter. Can you mind if I change my voice and act like one of them preachers? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is the Apostle Peter that made the statement that the Spirit, you got to say it, the, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out in the last days. 
And we know it was poured out on Pentecost. Therefore, that was the fulfillment of it. It was, it was about the Holy Spirit coming in the apostolic day and has nothing to do with us today. And people will sit there. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. No, they probably won't do anything because they'd run them out of the church if they did that. Now, I want you to listen to me because Peter then writes in his epistle about the last days. So here's what you've got to understand. When Peter stood up, he's in Jerusalem. He already has been told by Jesus that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed in a generation. Did you know Jesus told him in Matthew 23, all of this will come on this generation? A generation in Psalms of wickedness is always 40 years. God, Jesus said, I was, or the, uh, God said in Psalms, I was grieved with Israel, even this whole generation, for 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus is prophesying Jerusalem's destruction in 32 AD. It happened in 70 AD. How many years is that? Come on, mathematicians, help me. That's 38 years. That's a little less than a generation. Now, Here's what Peter is saying. If you will read the rest of Acts 2, he is warning Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jews, we are now in the last days. Not the last days leading to the rapture or the return of Jesus. The last days for all of you. So in these days, before Jerusalem is ruined, before you're left desolate, God is going to mercifully pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And the sons and daughters, which was the younger generation, they received it. And the servants and the handmaids. Hey, Mary was in the upper room. All the Catholic folks like that when they hear it. <laughs> Seriously. Mary, the mother of Christ, is in the upper room in Acts 1 when the Holy Spirit falls. So in other words, servants and handmaidens receive. Sons and daughters receive. And you can even go to Jewish history. There was all kinds of warnings of visions and dreams that were happening. And in less than 40 years, the sun was darkened. The moon was... I'm talking about cosmic signs. All these different things. Pillars of smoke was coming off the temple. Now, there's people that will take what I just said who are called preterists. And they will try to say to you, everything was fulfilled in 70 AD. And there's not going to be an antichrist. There's not going to be a rapture. There's not going to be anything. Because all of it happened in 70 AD. That's nonsense. And I can prove it to you. And don't have time to prove it to you. Don't get me stirred up. <laughs> Ain't anybody got time for that? <laughs> all right. Now, stay with me. Now... To understand a prophetic statement, you have to go to the context of which it's, it's written in. Let's go to Joel. If you go to Joel, what he talks about before he makes this prediction is, clean your ears out, the restoration of the nation of Israel at the time of the end. Go back and read it. I will restore to you the years the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and the palmer worm and the vat shall be full of new wine and oil. The land will be blessed. Now watch. He's telling, his, he's telling the Jews there will come a time when everything will be restored back that was lost. This is the thing Peter later said in Acts chapter Three, I think it's verse 21, when Peter talked about whom the heavens, speaking of Jesus, whom the heavens will receive until the times of the restitution of all things. He was predicting in chapter 2, the last days were upon him, but he wants to remind people in chapter 3 what Joel mentioned earlier. That a total, complete restitution is coming. The Greek word there for restitution is so long, I don't even, it's one of the few words I don't even try to pronounce in Greek. It's like three parts to one word. And that word means to restore an estate to its original owner. To restore land back to the original people. To restore a bone that has been broken. To restore a pothole in a road. I'm telling you that that one statement in Acts tells you that the heavens 
will keep crying. That the heavens will keep Christ in it. He will remain where he is until the restitution of what? Number one, the restitution of Israel as a nation, 1948. Number two. The restitution of Jerusalem as the capital. When did that happen? 1967. Number three, the Jews returning from Russia in the North Country. Where would that start happening? 1989. Number four, the restitution of the latter rains. When did that start happening? 1992. Number five, the desert blossoming like a rose. Isaiah 27, uh, Israel will blossom and fill the world with fruit. When did that start happening? In the year 2000, when they started putting all the farms in the Negev desert and down in the Ottawa finding underground water. So in other words ladies and gentlemen, there has been a restitution of everything the prophets have talked about up till this point. I, I'm going to tell you something in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you something you need to hear. I've studied this book um, every day of my life and I'm here to tell you there is not one thing left except the war of Gog and Magog and it could happen in the tribulation. It could happen at the beginning. It could happen somewhere uh, before the rapture or right after the rapture. We don't know. But I'm telling you, that's the only thing left that specifically has to take place where there is a restoration. The Bible said they have to be a great army. And I, Ezekiel, they are a great army. The Bible said they got to dwell in unwalled cities. They are in unwalled cities. The Bible said it happens when Israel is restored. They've been restored. So here's what I'm trying to say. If the heavens hold up Jesus until the time of the restitution of all things, it simply means it can't be much longer until the heavens let him go and the heavens release him to the earth and we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air and the dead in Christ are going to rise. Help me praise him now somebody in this house. Woo! Now watch this. This is where it gets interesting. Now, now remember I told you heavens have to receive Christ till his restitution that's connected to Israel, by the way. What did the, what did the disciples say to Jesus right before he went up? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It was all about Israel. What did, they, what did Jesus say back? It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father's put in his own power. Jesus is saying to them, there will come a restitution in God's time. From Adam to Abraham. I've got this in books. And you've got to add the number two years after the flood in the book of Genesis. You've got to put that two in there. From Adam, you take 130 years this child's born. 100 years this child's born. You take all those numbers in Genesis, go all the way to when Abraham, Abraham is born. And add the two years in Genesis after the flood. Our fact said it says two years after the flood. Use all the numbers. I can show it to you. It's exactly from Adam to Abraham, the man of the covenant, 1,948 years. When Jesus was born, Jesus born, second man Adam, to the restoration of Israel as a nation who is the seed of Abraham, it happened in 1948, 1,948 years later. Hello, same parallel. Thank you, all 10 of you that are excited about that. If you've never seen that, that ought to make you hoop and holler. Say, whoa, that's deep. That's deep. Now, let's, let's look at it again. If Joel is talking about the Spirit being poured out, he, tells you, he gives you the key when it's going to happen. Two keys. Here we go. This is the message. Two keys. It shall come to pass afterwards, I'll pour out my Spirit. What is the afterwards? Here we go. After the restoration of Israel starts. I'm a student of the healing revival. In 1948, on May 14th, David Ben-Gurion, it was actually between the, it was made official the 15th, but on the 14th of May, he got up in Tel Aviv and announced a new nation had been born in a day, and it would be called Israel. Did you know in June of that, that 30 days later, 30 days later in the month of June, a revival struck the United States headed up by William Branham, Jack Cole, A.A. A. Allen, T.L. Osborne, T.L. Lowry, Morris Sorella, Oral Roberts, and I can't name the rest of them because there's 20 more men who all started their ministry in June 1948. Wow. Wow. Say 
same year, 1948. And all this became known by Gordon Lindsay, Voice of Healing, as the Restoration Revival. And why did God send this crazy revival? And I could, my dad saw the miracles. I've, I've heard people tell me how that Oral Roberts prayed for a kid that didn't have a bone, and a bone was created right there, and the kid ran all over the tent in the Ohio Valley, and everybody started shouting, Oral Roberts couldn't get the service back. Thea Jones prayed for a boy that had no eyeballs in his head, two white sockets, no retina, no pupil, no nothing, and, and uh, outside of North, in North Carolina, and and my pastor friend, Monroe Horn, is on the platform five feet away and said that boy got blue eyes in five minutes and saw for the first time and was born blind. I'm telling you, miracles start happening. Thea Jones went to the Alabama Church of God camp meeting in the 1940s, and he went to pray for a Catholic priest that had a cancer. They brought a Catholic priest on a cot in a, an old ambulance that had a cancer up in his neck. And when Thea prayed and rebuked the cancer, it fell out by the roots that deep on the platform, and that Catholic priest priest got up screaming and running to the shock of all those old time Church of God people sitting there at the Church of God camp meeting in Birmingham, Alabama. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. I'm trying to say that 1948 was the beginning of the nation of Israel, born as an infant, reborn as an infant, born again out of the womb of time. And all of a sudden, the same year, this revival hits for exactly seven years where big tents go up, 15, 20,000 people attending. T.L. Lowry came out of that meeting and healings and miracles happening like crazy. And it was called the Restoration Revival. And I've studied it, my friend, for 44 years. It's the first thing I studied when I was called to preach at age 16. I know about everything about it. I've been blessed. I have been blessed that I have in my possession Oral Roberts' alligator, alligator briefcase that he preached in in the tents in the 1950s and carried his sermons in. His daughter sent me every book that he wrote, books I've never seen. Oral, Oral signed the last five first edition books I had in my library of him, sent them to me personally with a handwritten note before he died. And Oral Roberts' daughter sent me a stack of sermons that he preached in the tent in the 1950s that I have in my possession and I'm telling you I know about the healing revival it's been my, my I guess you'd say side hobby to study it my whole life now watch this but the second thing that happens in restoration because Joe said afterward afterward I'll pour out my spirit so here we go the nation of Israel gets restored and after it is restored what happens a seven-year healing revival but then Jerusalem gets united as the capital of Israel. It was divided between East and West, Jordan and Israel. And it gets, it gets the Six-Day War breaks out. And by the seventh day of the Six-Day War, Jerusalem is the capital. It's, it's now the united capital of Israel. There was a thing called no man's land. The Jordanians and Israelis put a big concrete wall up about as high as this balcony right there with barbed wire on top. And Israel started tearing that thing down. And they united the city of Jerusalem in June of 1967. But did you know what also started happening in June of 1967? Are you all ready for this? I don't know if you're ready for this. The charismatic movement. Same year. Charismatic Library said it started in 1967, right on the parallel of Jerusalem being united as the capital of Israel. And what did the Charismatic Revival do? Just like there was west and east in Jerusalem. The Jordanians had one side, the Israelis had another side. And there was a division between those two. The Jordanians stayed in their camp, the Israelis stayed in their camp. But when 1967 came, they tore the wall down and east and west met together. The Arabs and the Jews met together. There's been a controversy. I know that, but they met together in 1967 and it became one big city. Can I tell you what the charismatic renewal did? The Baptists were in their camp. The Presbyterians were in their camp. The Catholics were in their camps. The Pentecostal was in their camps and everybody had their little wall up hiding under their little bushels. And in 1967, thanks to a glow, thanks to the full gospel businessmen international, thanks to all these units, all those barriers and walls came down just like they did in Jerusalem and the people got together for the first time and received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. That was the time of Catherine Kuhlman. That was the time of the Word of Faith movement. All of these big movements that we now talk about started in 1967. Now I can take you, and I don't have time to do it because I want to focus on this final thing, but I can take you through history, our history, our time, show you in 88, 89, 92, 93, 95, 98, 2000, how what begins to happen in Israel being restored starts having a reflection in the church and in the body of Christ. So watch this. It'll come to pass afterwards, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. So we got that down, right? We know what the afterwards is. It's after the restoration. Here is your big key of the coming of the Lord. Here's the trigger. 
It's right at the end of this verse. And I'm going to read it to you. Don't, you don't have to go there. I'm going to read it to you. He talks about, watch the cosmic signs in the heavens. You all know about the four blood moons that happened a few years ago on Passover and Tabernacles. That was a huge sign. People, don't, people still haven't quite got that, but it was. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood. And actually, rabbinically, it doesn't mean the moon's going to have blood all over it. People are going to kill each other on the moon. It's a lunar eclipse, which... Israel's, Israel's emblem is based on moon cycles and not sun cycles because God didn't want them worshiping the sun. The festivals occur when you see the sliver of the moon or when the moon is full. There's two festivals that come on full moons, Passover and Tabernacles. So the moon has always been an emblem for Israel. Remember when Joseph had the dream, the sun, moon, and stars bowed before him, and what, is this, what does his dad say? Well, I, your mother, and your 11 brothers bow. The 11 brothers are represented by the 11 major constellations in heaven. If you count Joseph, that's 12 constellations. The sun represented the daddy, and the moon represented the mother. There's a woman in the Bible. The sun is under her feet. The moon's above her head. 12 stars on her head. Revelation chapter 12. It goes back to the story of Joseph. It's the nation of Israel. Am I, am I overloading you? The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. Watch. Before the great and notable day of the Lord. Before the great, this is how Joel says it, and terrible day of the Lord. Do you know what the great and terrible day of the Lord is? It's the day of vengeance. It's the day of wrath. It is known in the New Testament as the great tribulation. So he says... The restoration will come before the tribulation. The cosmic signs will occur before the tribulation. And I'll pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters before the tribulation. The last, God, I thank you. The last great sign, and I want everybody to hear this. Because I am thankful to God. I get to be a little part of this. The last great sign before Jesus comes back is the great outpouring on the sons and daughters of the servants and the handmaidens. And in case you didn't know who that is, that happens to be your kids, your teenagers, your children, your grandbabies. Come on, they're going to be some five-year-olds speaking in tongues. They're gonna, I believe it. I believe they're going to be some five-year-olds just laying out getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You better praise God for your children. Hey, they're going to be in on this thing. They're going to be in on this thing. Let me throw a couple stories in here and then we're going to pray for some folks. Let me just tell you this. Huh. Some of you have heard me tell this and Pam, my wife is sitting over there and we had to live through this. But my boy one night took, Pam, the, the, doc, the nurse told us it was about 70 pills. My boy took 70 pills. He wasn't trying to kill himself. He was trying to psych himself up for some kind of music and lights that he liked. And when he came downstairs, I knew he was messed up. And I I, I took his pulse. I held his pulse. And his heart was going. I said, son, your heart's beating so fast, I can't even count the pulse beats. And we got scared. And he started seeing flashes of lights like he was going out. And we took him to the emergency room. I didn't even let him put his pants on. He had, I think he had his, his underwear, his, what do you call him, boxers on, his T-shirt. I said, I don't, you ain't getting dressed. You're getting, because I'm thinking they're going to have to pump his stomach. And the lady said, no, it's already in the system. We can't pump him now. And then he went into a room, and Mama over here and my little daughter are sitting in the uh, outside of the room, and I'm with the doctor who tells my son, who he tells me privately, he's from my church uh, in, North, in North Cleveland Church. He said, Pastor, he said, Brother Perry, Pastor, he said, um, 18 kids have died doing the same thing he did. He said, I'm not trying to scare him. He said, your boy's in trouble. When they hooked him up, his heartbeat was 200 beats a minute. And that doctor said his heart could explode in his chest. He's not an athlete. Nobody, nobody's heart should be beating that fast. And I didn't tell Jonathan that. He went to 180, 190, and then he'd get scared. And the more he got scared, I guess it was an adrenaline rush, and he'd go higher, and I'm trying to calm him down. And he looked at me that night, uh, and he said, uh, doctor left and gave him this little button to push if his heart quit. And he told him, he said, I can't, I can't promise I can bring you back if your heart quits. And my son, when that doctor left, looked at me, and he was terrified. 
And he said, Daddy, I'm not trying to kill myself. He said, but you got to pray for me that I won't die tonight because I don't want to die young. You, have a, you, you talk about feeling helpless and about that big. When your son is looking to you, telling you, you better be able to have a prayer life close enough to God to keep me from dying. And I had to, I had to fight it, Pastor, with promises. God told me, God knows this. I, I, I finally told my boy a while back, I said, when you were born, the Lord told me that you were going to have a battle. He told, I'm telling you, years ago, he said, you're saying, remember this baby? He's going to have a battle. And God spoke to me and said, but in the end, he's going to be okay. And I held on to that. You know, when God gives you a word, the enemy tries to steal it. So the enemy said to me, yeah, the end is he's going to die. That's the end. That's how it's going to end. He's going to die. Oh, he'll be saved, but he'll die. I said, no, that's not what God said. And I kept saying, God didn't give me a boy for him to die. God didn't give me this son. He's the only boy I got. He's the only thing that can carry on my name. And I'm not having it. And I'm telling you, I had to stand against a devil of death for five hours while my boy was hooked up to monitors. And I said that moment, I said, devil, I'm going to make you pay. I said, no, you're going to pay. I said, you, you know, you just touched the wrong kid's dad. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I may have cussed him out a little bit if you, don't, you want me to be very honest with you. Come on. There's a time to cuss and not to cuss. How many know what I'm talking about? Where are my black folks in this house? I need some black folks to help me out. These white folks don't even know what I'm talking about. Come on, you got an auntie and a grandma when you tick her off. She said, buddy, you better watch out. I'm going to take a baseball bat after you. No, you, you let your boy die and you know it's the devil. You'll take a different. It, it, it ain't no little, oh, Jesus, we just ask you. Satan, get your hands off of him now. You let it happen to you. You'll find out just how you get stirred up. I may have shot him a bird while I was talking. I don't know. I probably didn't do that. Y'all bear with me. I'm getting carried away. I'm getting carried away. You're going you're to think I'm the unsanctified pet preacher. I'm going to tell you, you deal with a bunch of devils, you'll get unsanctified real quick. I wish somebody would help me in this house. I feel like I just lost this whole place. I wish somebody would help me. When you're fighting the devil, there comes a time to tell him, shut up. Do you understand when Jesus said, hold your peace? I looked it up in Greek. He didn't say, hold your peace. He said, devil, shut up. Shut up, mighty. Shut up, devil. Shut up. Shut your mouth. Get out of my life. Shut up. My boy came and asked mama for prayer one time. Me and mama prayed. My wife is quiet, but I heard her walk up the steps to the room and say, devil, I want you to know I'm the mama of this house. That's my boy you're messing with. And you're not going to, she, I remember her prayer. I just sat down in the theater room and said, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's 3.30 in the morning. I'm tired. I'll just go to bed. Mama, why you pray? Because when you get it, mama stirred up and the devil trying to take out your kids and you know you got some faith left in you. There's something that'll rise up on the inside. Shut your mouth, devil. You get out of this place. I'm not having it. You ain't taking my babies. I've been there. You look at me. I've been there. Huh. Five, five thirty in the morning, they wheeled him to a room and the nurse is in there and I'm, I'm going to stay with him. I'm not leaving him. They said, we're going to have a counselor come in sometime tomorrow. I said, that's fine. But I said, ma'am, I ain't sitting in that chair sleeping. I'm laying right beside my boy in that bed. She said, preacher, we're not supposed to let you do that. But we know you. And you're paying the bills. So help yourself. And I told my boy, I said, slide over. He said, Dad, what you doing? I said, I'm laying beside you till you go to sleep and this thing's over. And I laid there and said, well, Satan, I want you to know something. You just, you, you, you got me provoked. And I, I'm not on some emotional trip right now. I'm coming after kids. I'm going to help somebody else's kid to prevent this from happening, devil. I'm going to help somebody's kid. I want you to know. And I didn't know what I meant. And let me just tell you the bottom line. I built an $18 million building that holds up to 5,000 young people without chairs and started something called Warrior Fest every year. Right now, right now in the month of January, and this has never happened, Warrior Fest 1 has 4,400 kids registered. Warrior Fest 2 has 6,800 kids registered. 
And they're fill, they will fill that hall up on a Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. And then we lay hands on every one of them in the building on Sunday in what's called a fire tunnel. And let me tell you something. Every time, every time that we have an altar call, every time a guest speaker speaks, every time I watch kids fall out and snot coming out of their nose and their eyes red with tears and they get up drunk in the spirit, I look back at a soundboard to a boy that's 30 years old who happens to be my son who ran the sound who ran the lights who ran the screen and I say that's it devil you're paying again you're paying again and every warrior fest you're paying again glory to God hallelujah Now I, just, I just want to tell you something. That's not the end of it. Somebody somewhere going to give me millions of dollars to get a youth camp built. You hear me? Oh, I'll come back and tell you one day. You all act like you don't believe it. I've had to pray in $40 million for my ministry. I've had to pray it in, and I'm going to pray till some millionaire can't sleep at night that's got money, and God's going to give him a vision of my face. Yes, sir. Because I'm not... I ain't finished yet. I'm not finished paying the enemy out. I'm not finished with what God has. I'm not finished with what the Holy Ghost wants to do. We're on the verge of something big. Come okay, ask you one question. About done. Let me ask you one question. Why is the battle so big on this generation? Have you noticed it? I mean, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's pornography. It's homosexuality. It's transvestite. I mean, you got these things that they're battling. They're struggling with. They don't. They, they're struggling with their identity. They're struggling with their sexuality. It's just like this really huge. And I never saw. I, look, I never saw this like coming growing up like this. Have you? If you're if you're fifty or sixty, you have to say we well, never saw this growing up. And instead of me focusing on how did we get there, I asked the Lord. I said, "You tell me, Father, why." And he spoke to me and he said, because son, now you listen to this. There was two generations that had a promise. The generation that existed when I was born. He fulfilled 39 major prophecies, just Jesus in his ministry and suffering. And over 300, if you add John the Baptist and all the other, Jesus had a generation with 300 prophecies fulfilled when he came. Crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, born of a virgin, Born in Bethlehem, sold for 30 pieces of silver. It's all in the Bible. Laid in a rich man's grave, Isaiah 53. His stripes were healed, 300. And he said to me, there's only one other generation that has a great promise. And it's this one. Because I said, after the restoration, I'll pour out my spirit. But before the tribulation, I'll be done with it. And he said, the enemy is trying to preempt an outpouring. I had two men that took cocaine. I've never taken that in my life, thank God. I'm going to tell you something. If I wasn't saved, I'd be dead by now. No, no, no. You, I didn't know. You didn't hear what I said. If I was not saved, I'd be dead. I'd be wild. Because I'm wild in the Holy Ghost. And I know if I wasn't saved, I'd be really wild the other way. How do you know that? I just know. You, look, I'd be down. I'd be the guy at the bar going, hey. I'd be moving and grooving. I mean, look, at, look at the shirts I'm wear, wearing as a 60-year-old oh, preacher. Does that not tell you something? <laughs> but here's what I want to say. The battle is on because God is about to do something big. I want to give, I'm going to give you one word. And I think when I was here last year, I may have told this, but I want to add something to it. Can, I'm, can I add something to it? I get a call one day from a man. I'm not going to tell you who it was. He's a very close friend. And he was in the city of Jerusalem. And he'd gotten back from Jerusalem. He said, I got to tell you what happened to me. He said, I've never had nothing happen like this in my life. And this is a very, very good, everybody here would know him. Godly man. And he said, we were in Jerusalem and my wife and I were sleeping and a rainstorm hit. And it hit so hard that it felt like it was going to pelt the hotel, hotel down. Just, just the rain. And he said, I laid there and tried to go back to sleep. And I got into a zone where I heard the voice of God in the rain. An actual voice, not in my mind. And God began to speak. And he said, I started crying so convulsively. 
My wife said, what's wrong? He said, don't say nothing. Turn the light on, go over there to the, to the desk, get a piece of paper and write everything I tell you. And the Lord spoke to him in the dream. And I'm going to say this publicly because this is what God told this minister. He said, and I'm going to have to paraphrase it. He said, God said, I'm about to do something big. I'm coming down to do it. I'm coming to the earth myself to, to, to accomplish it. And he said, too many churches are denying my spirit. They're trying to make the people so happy that they're not even allowing my power to work. And listen to this. And God said, when I do what I'm about to do, I am going to bypass every one of those churches. Every one. They will not encounter what I'm about to do. But for every man or woman of God that has never denied my power, never denied the gifts of the Spirit, and has allowed me to work, I'm about to visit them in my power and spirit in a way they've never experienced before. Thank you for listening to STL Radio.